Welcome to the React Show. We've got a really fantastic show in store for everyone today. Uh, we're going to be talking about bugs, bug-free code, you know, well, almost. Uh, how to get there. Uh, it's going to be really fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so I'm Thomas, and this is my co-host, Austin. Uh, we're with Owl Creek at owlcreek.studio. Uh, and yeah, welcome, Austin. Yeah, thanks for having me as always. Definitely looking forward to this episode. Uh, it was a buggy week last week, so it'll be good to go over. Uh, I know last or two weeks ago, we talked about how to debug code. Uh, so I hope that this is a good continuation on, on that topic. Yeah, that's right. I, I had forgotten about that, actually. Um, yeah, we did. We talked about how, how to find the bugs when, once they are there. Um, yeah, so let's, uh, let's hop into it. So the first thing is, you know, there's a, a lot of, you know, research that's been done into this topic, and, you know, people have a lot of opinions. Um, I think mostly, though, what we're talking about is uh, the situation where you're often having to write code pretty quickly. Uh, you know, pressure comes down from the top to ship code, um, and there just isn't a lot of, you know, room to maybe do more rigorous testing or, you know, uh, processes around preventing bugs. Um, so uh, what we're going to be talking about especially is how do you write code and, and manage a team and stuff um, in the situation where you need to go fast and you can't sit there and spend you know, weeks QAing everything and testing everything. And, but, you know, so, so that's most of what we're going to be referring to. Um, and, and yeah, so uh, I think I'll, I'll hop right into it with my number one uh, thing, which I call the bug rule. And that is more code equals more bugs. I think this is something that uh, everyone probably knows intuitively to some extent, like you write more code, it's, going to have more bugs but i think the implications are pretty pretty big um basically it the bigger your code base the more bugs you're going to have there's uh been lots of studies in this um and this is true no matter what you do uh there's things you can do to minimize bugs but overall the more lines of code you have the less concise your code is essentially the more bugs you're going to have um I don't know if that's if you've noticed that you know anecdotally at all, um, Austin or. Uh, I think you muted yourself, by the way. Oh yeah, I did. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I'm unmuted now. Uh, <laughs> What I was saying was when I think about what, the first thing that came to mind is, yeah, the more code you have, uh, yeah, the more that you're having, like, you're, the more you're processing with each line that you write. So there's, like, if you're not succinctly processing your functions or whatever it is you're writing, there is more chance for a failure as you go through. And then if you have an ecosystem of big code interacting with big code, the chance that um, these highly modified or whatever you've done to them in these big scripts are going to match up with uh, other use cases perfectly, that definitely gets lower and lower the bigger and bigger things become. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um I, yeah, I think this is a really a really big thing that people often sort of ignore. Um, and and like my one of my favorite languages actually is Lisp. One of the reasons for that is because it's very concise. The language gives you a lot of tools to write less code essentially. And to me, that just means a better program by definition. Less less code, less bugs. Um, and I, I you can see the opposite. You know, this is something everyone you know sort of makes fun of at this point but like a java code base where you're basically forced to write tons and tons of code and in my experience that's why you see things like you know eclipse or, or whatever large massive code bases they're just so buggy um it's just that's just how it goes 
Um, but when we look at like React and React projects, I think, I guess this is actually more than just React projects, but something I often run into with React as well is you'll get pressure, um, you know, often from management to write more code. And by this, I mean, a lot of times managers and, and like tech leads will look at a code base and think, I want to be able to have programmers jump into any part of this code base and start working on it. I want to be able to hire more programmers. And, you know, basically I want my programmers to be cogs in the machine, not specialists, you know, skilled in this trade. Uh, and so, you know, something I, I run into, I've uh, always run into is I want to make my code more concise. And concise code is not necessarily more readable and not necessarily something you can just jump into because properly abstracted code often means like domain specific languages. And, you know, basically you got to like spend some time to understand whatever is going on. The advantage is once you do, you can work with the code and change it in a consistent way without like unknowingly introducing bugs. And, and that's a big, big part of why I think concise code and less code is, is better because when you can jump into code after you've like learned the abstraction and make changes without worrying about it breaking 50 other things, it makes it way easier to refactor and make good code. And it also makes fixing code and adding features a lot more bug free. Um, so to me, the bug rule, you know, more code equals more bugs is something that you just always need to remember and, and try to achieve, even if, you know, it might mean fighting management at times. I think in general, it's worth it. And it's worth it for the managers, even if they don't know it. At least that's my opinion. I don't know if they'll all agree, but. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there is a, there is some sort of, Thing about writing more lines you know like especially if you've been working on something for x amount of time and you submit your pull request and it's only x hundred amount of lines of code whereas oh you were working on that for like at least a whole day shouldn't there be a lot more code to it and uh, a lot is missed and just by looking at that length of code written as a metric uh there's a lot that's missed and it doesn't really uh it's not a good standard to yeah. say that like quality yeah i totally forgot about that that you're absolutely right that is another massive problem with the and i, I have this down on my list to talk about later you know the the team and how it works on code i mean that is often the standard that people look at is just like, oh, wow, they did a lot of work. They wrote a lot of code, and especially managers, especially if they don't do a lot of coding anymore. Um, that's what they're looking at. And so you just end up encouraging more bugs in your code base, a more unmaintainable code base. It, it's a bad situation all around. Um, and we'll talk more about like the team and, and the process later on. But that's a it's a really great point I hadn't thought of. Um, yeah, the, the next thing I was wanting to get into is, um, maybe more of like a, a detail oriented part of this. Um, and, and that is, I think of code as contracts. So especially when I'm jumping into a new code base, I look at, you know, like say in React, you have your, your props that get, get passed in and you have your output, which is you know, the DOM output, you know, essentially. Um, and that's, you know, definitely a contract that I always keep in mind. You know, I start there. So like if I'm um, working on a component I'm not that familiar with that I, you know, if I wrote something myself and I understand it fully, I might treat this a little differently. But most of the time I look at the component and I go, okay, this code is probably written this way for a reason. And there's probably other parts of the code that are relying on the behavior of this code to be the way it is. So to me, it's very important not to change that contract. The other components should be able to continue passing in the same props and the same values and getting the same output. 
Um, so like you'll see me, if you look at a lot of my code, if I'm extending a component, I'm adding new props, I'm giving it a default value that will make it work the way it had in the past if you don't specify that prop. Um, so that's a very common thing that I do is anytime, and same with functions, if I'm extending a function, I'll add a, a new parameter and give it a default value. So that old code, if I forget to update it or I miss it or something, it's gonna continue to work the way that it is expected to work. Um, but I take that to a really fine grain level. Like even the logic of the component itself, I, I look at that very carefully. I rarely change it without making it backwards compatible because unless I really, really understand what's going on um, and, and have good tests and stuff, I don't wanna risk you know, introducing a bug I didn't know about. Um, so I, I look at every line of code, every function call, everything as a contract between you know, a sender and a receiver. And if I'm gonna break that contract, in my head it's like a really big deal. Like I, I'm gonna figure out what the implications of this are. And if I don't have the time to figure out those implications, but I don't have time to test it, I'm not gonna break that contract. I'm gonna figure out some way to, to not do it. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way I look at it. I, I'm curious what, what you think about that, Austin. So yeah, the next uh, thing I wanted to talk about, um, which might be more controversial, is fail fast and fail hard and fail right away. Uh, this isn't something I always apply necessarily, but for React applications, for web applications, I, I generally do it. Um, and the idea is, I don't necessarily have like error boundaries in most places or anything like that. If there's a bug, I want it to bring down the application. And there's two reasons for that. Number one, it's way easier to debug it when you're failing at the source of the problem and getting a stack trace. What a lot of people will do is add error handling all over. And that really convolutes like where the error is actually coming from. Um, and so if it's like an expected error, like from an API or something, of course I'm gonna handle that properly. But if it's something unexpected, I try to just let the application fail as it would fail so I get the natural results of whatever this bug is, makes it more recognizable, makes it easier to find. Um, and the other thing is, uh, a big problem with bugs that are hard to debug are when you've tried to sort of solve bugs, potential unexpected bugs in sort of, I don't know, I call them kind of hacky ways. Like maybe you take the return value of a function, you're like, oh, if this is an error or some weird condition I'm not expecting, I just try to work with it. And there are applications where that makes sense, um, but most of the React applications I work on, I think it creates more problems because you end up in the situation where your program state is different further down the line than it was designed for. And it's probably in unexpected ways. And then the code behaves even more weirdly. So you'll be like, you know, why can't, why can't only customers from Alaska get charged or whatever? And you're like, I can't find any issues with this code. It looks perfectly fine. When in reality, the actual bug was like somewhere completely different and the state of the application just got out of whack. And so that's why, um, and this is not a new thing, but it's, it's why I definitely ascribe to the methodology of when you can, just fail fast and fail hard because it's way easier to find the problems. You're way more likely to find them right away. And it's, yeah, it doesn't create other future problems. Like I've run into situations where I had to, de I debugged like eight different bugs only to find out they were all caused by some initial situation where somebody had tried to handle an error and didn't do it right. And so, yeah, that's, that's why if you work with me, you might end up in a situation where it just crashes and people are upset. But the thing is, then you find out really soon and you can fix it really quickly for these, for, so it doesn't happen to a bunch of users. Like that's, to me, a really bad situation is a bug that shows up subtly for a bunch of people and it's not getting logged and nobody really knows about it for months, but you're just like losing customers and losing money. So to me, that's why I, I like try to make things fail fast and fail hard. Yeah, no, I really, I like that idea. It, it, 
it happened to us last week on a project we're working on. There was some stuff with server side rendering, and it just like it brought down the whole uh, application for uh, a certain use case. But then once we fixed it, which was an easy fix, uh, everything is working as expected, and we we know what what's going on. Uh, yeah, I've been in situations where. I've tried like creating these hacky uh, conditionals to be like, well, if yep. it comes back as an error, then you do this. But like you said, it can lead to you're going down a whole different creek uh, at <laughs> yeah, that exactly. point. Uh, you're probably not supposed to be going down that just to what, like ultimately make the user feel like everything is working even though it's it really hasn't been working and the the bug is still there you're just like hiding it at that point yeah absolutely so it's not it's not really productive yeah yeah you said that well um i do want to say um, I was actually, you know, last week, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the server side rendering issue. That's actually a case where I don't think the way I had set it up was quite correct. Um, in the case of server side rendering and you have a server, and in this case, it's the only server. Um, if there was a JavaScript error like there was, it actually brought down the whole server. Um, and, and that meant it had to be brought up again. Um, you know, which took time, and yeah, it, it was definitely not, to me, that's not the ideal situation. Um, what I actually did since then is added, at the very highest level, something that just catches errors, logs, and logs them, and returns a 500 response. Um, and I think that's actually still acceptable, because you're, you're, you're not, like, trying to figure out in the code how to handle errors. You're just catching them at the last possible moment, and you're isolating the error to that. I call it like a sub-program. So when somebody makes a request, you run a sub-program. I think I want that sub-program to die as fast. That should fail fast. But I don't want the whole server to die. And so I think there is that distinction to make. Whereas like another issue we had was at one point was you know, just a JavaScript error on the web, you know, the React app itself, which crashes the app and and that's the situation where i think it, it worked out great because it's just oh here i can reproduce this here's the the stack trace and we just find the find the issue um and that would work fine on server-side rendering as well we just don't want to like actually literally bring down the whole server well i mean the the server-side rendering uh, you saying that you set it up improperly, it goes back to the intro of this talk when you have to move fast and you're not given time to properly do things and you're on a crunch, like bugs will happen. And that's just part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like we talked about in our, our previous episode about bugs is, yeah, they're going to happen. Um, you can't beat yourself up about it. Um, but I definitely look at the situation afterwards and go, is there any way that we could have prevented this bug in a systemic way? Um, so those are the things that I look to change, you know, going forward. I, I, I'm not as big of a fan of necessarily like trying to find ways to fix that particular bug across the app on like by like going through it line by line and fixing them or something. I mean, that might be required, but like I'm definitely looking for like process improvements, systemic improvements, you know, that type of thing. Um, yeah, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, something that I don't know if I've ever seen people say before. I don't know. Probably somebody has somewhere. Uh, but when I hop into a new code base, um, one I'm not familiar with or a new part of the code base, I, I copy existing conventions. So I, I look through like the React component, uh, you know, whatever imports there might be, the way things are being exported, everything about the code, and I try to copy it you know, until I'm familiar with the code, because it goes back to the code as a contract. There might be something in here that I don't know about, some way things work in this ecosystem or whatever that I don't know about. So I copy whatever it's doing, even if it's different than the way I would normally do things. 
um, that's what I do to start is just like, yeah, is there anything in here that I should follow, you know, and I do, I'll, I'll write it in the same style just to make sure I'm not introducing bugs I never knew were a thing where somebody else already, you know, went through and did it in a certain way, but they, you know, didn't note it in the file or something. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you had anything you wanted to say. Well, about that, that also kind of, that to what you said earlier as well with like writing succinct code, making sure that it's written in a way that's understood so that not only you can interact with it uh, in the future better, but so that people can actually have a chance of coming into a succinct, well-written system and like be able to navigate it effectively, which will by like writing in standard practices consistently the you also reduce the chance for bugs in that way as well yeah yeah that's a really good point um yeah if you if you write consist like code that behaves consistently and is consistently understandable you'll be able to have new people work on it it's the same way yeah that makes sense um so another thing um i wanted to talk about which might be something, I guess in my experience, something that it seems like people think only larger companies do or whatever, but I do it all over and I think it's super useful. And that is automated end-to-end -end integration testing. Um, so I, I do not actually, sh I think maybe the only reluctance to other people doing this is along the lines of we need to go fast and we don't have time to work on it. Um, but I go fast and I do make it so there's time to work on it. And the reason is because once I, d I don't always do it at the start, but once I have software that's like kind of gelled a bit, you know, so it's not changing all the time, I go through and write these tests. And I firmly believe it saves me and the rest of the team way more time than I invest into it. Number one, because we can find bugs before they get deployed, obviously, which is fantastic. Um, and number two, it makes working with the code base in the future a lot faster. So um, lately I've been using Cypress to do automated integration testing on most of the code bases I work on. And in one case, I needed to do a big refactoring. And normally I'm really hesitant and careful about how I do it because of the whole code as a contract thing. Like I need to make sure I'm not breaking those contracts. Um, but if I have a good solid test suite, it's a lot easier because the test suite should be catching those contracts. Um, and so I was able to do the refactoring really quickly. And as far as I know, there were no issues with it and no bugs. It just worked. Um, and that's definitely, definitely, definitely because of my testing. I would write the code, run the tests, and they would fail. I'd, you know, obviously go fix them until everything was passing again. Um, and that's the way that I look at basically like code as contracts. I, I look that at that the same as with like automated testing. If I'm going to change code, it either needs to have some good automated tests or I need to fully understand this contract if I'm going to modify it, you know? And so I definitely still keep that in mind. Like maybe when I, like when I was doing this refactoring, there were some things that I changed where I'm like, oh, I don't think this isn't in the test. So I make sure, okay, I'm going to test that manually. You know, like I still keep it in mind. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily cover everything, but I have found super high amount of return on my investment for it, even though I often find it's a hard sell um, to, to let people have me do it. I think you're uh, muted, Austin. Oh, I double clicked the mute unmute. I I was I, I was too fast. Happy trigger finger. Um, yeah. So a a thing with the end to end testing I find is that people are reluctant to like learn another thing when they like aren't mm -hmm. quote convinced that it's really going to do something, and then like 
getting these because they don't really know what like they're developing maybe even like they're they're kind of so micro focused into creating the little parts of the program that they haven't had time to look through the bigger picture of it and then to go through and add these pretty simple ids or test labels uh and simulate use um just becomes easy to put on the back burner but yeah it's quite i mean with the <clears throat> the part of the software we're working on together that you have written the the end-to-end -end test for they're very thorough and there's pretty much like no part of it that is not accounted for uh therefore like you you know every time and that when you push something you're the the user on the other end is going to get the same experience as, as the the automated suite did which is yeah it's well worth it for really a little little bit of time invested you just have to get in get in the rhythm of knowing how to implement these effectively i think that's the biggest hurdle yeah, that's true. Um, there is some overhead in, in learning how to, to do it. Um, yeah, that's a tough one. Um, aside from learning how to do it on your own, it, it, can, it would be very tough at a lot of places to convince them to let you learn how to do it, let the whole team learn how to do it, and then actually do it. Um, even though I think it, you know, it really pays for itself. That's, that's true. And like you were talking about the, the project um, that I implemented the, the test for. Um, yeah, that's like, that's so, I'm so glad I did because now it's like every little change, I can just make it and not really have to run through and test every single scenario. Like there's a bunch of scenarios and I don't have to go through and test them all for every little change. So I can be like, oh, yeah, no problem. I can do that change. It'll take like 20 minutes, you know, and I don't have to spend a half hour testing it afterwards, you know. So it, it just gives me a lot more confidence as well. Yeah, agreed. I mean, especially with the feature you're working on seeming to kind of fractal out into uh like multiple features now since they're kind of like based on the same template uh it seems to be quite effective that you wrote these ahead of time especially yeah yeah i i'm, I'm happy <laughs> um all right uh so the next thing we could talk about is just the the team and the process and, and communication um things that i think are maybe not like a technical thing you can just go implement now but to me i think are also really important um so like you know the process of committing new code to the code base what does that look like um in my experience everybody wants to do code review so you have somebody else on your team or maybe a couple other people on your team look at your code and I would say 80%, maybe 90% of those code reviews, in my experience, are just people reading through it line by line, looking for like style issues mostly. I mean, maybe a, a thing here or there that might be some minor issue actually with the code, but people aren't really looking for, okay, so I, I guess I'll contrast it to what I do. So when I do a code review, I don't, I don't usually care that much about style or convention or like, you know, the way things were written. I, I try to look at the code for, you know, is this code a coherent piece of code? Is it concise? Is it, um, you know, does it have like bugs at like the sort of algorithmic layer, you know? So it's not something where you can just like look at a line of code and be like, yes, there's a bug. You have to like read through the code and think, okay, is there a bug in the logic? You know, those are the kinds of things where a team's process can make a huge difference because if you're only looking for, you know, style issues mostly, you're not really going to make your code much better. By doing code reviews, you're not going to prevent bugs. But you can prevent bugs if you actually try to understand how the code works. And so, yeah, I'm sure, you know, Austin's had plenty of code reviews by now he, and, and knows I don't necessarily pick out 
small stuff. But yeah, if I think like something could be written better, that's where I'm going to call you out. And, and that's can be controversial on a team, especially if there's pressure to get things shipped and like that kind of thing slows you down. Um, so I try to use it carefully, um, but, but yeah, to me, I think that's super important, you know, is, is doing, if you're going to do code reviews, actually make them useful and not just a formality, you know. Well, and as you're talking about reviews, I feel like a, a big part of preventing bugs is like previews to like align with your team on coming to an agreement if this sort of implementation standard makes sense to go through with for a feature because like sure maybe you own that part of the application but like you're not going to be there forever right yeah and to like make sure that you have like an understanding within your team about like how should we be writing things to begin with uh helps ensure that when you get to that review that you don't even have to necessarily debug logical flows because like there there was like a pre-educational sort of understanding of what you're trying to accomplish together as a team. Yeah, I, that actually ties in perfectly to the next point I had on this, which was communication is, I mean, I, we've talked a lot about all sorts of things at this point, but communication is ultimately, if you're working on a team, probably the best way to prevent bugs. In my experience, if you have good communication between everyone that is working on code that you're working on or, you know, that it interfaces with, um, there's no substitute for that because we all interpret code differently. So and we all interpret everything differently. All of us have different views on how everything works. You know, even the same, even a simple function, everybody will have a different view on, on it. And so it's super important to have good communication between everyone on the team, you know, and, and have it be accepted that you can just look at, you know, do a git blame on some code and, and look at who wrote it and go hit them up and, and be like, hey, can you just like fill me in on this code? You know, like, is there anything I should watch out for? Or how does this work? Like that kind of thing is more important than probably, I mean, I don't know if it's more important than the bug rule, but <laughs> maybe everything else. Um, it's probably the single, it could be the single best way to prevent bugs. Well, I mean, there's a life lesson in there, you know, it's like in that it applies to anything like creating bugs in your life. You know, if you, uh, if you're not sure about something in, you could maybe figure it out on your own. That doesn't mean that you're aligned with what the intentions were when that code was written by someone else. So that like, you going forward with it is going to create some sort of unintended side effects or it's just in general, it's always good to communicate. Like uh, never, especially if you're in a team, it, sure, there may be pressure to, like, be, like, be a performer and be able to, like, have high output and productivity, but if you're not able to just ask for help and reach out to your teammates, like, you should evaluate the team you're on if you don't feel like you can do that. And you should evaluate like why, like what is really holding you back from asking for help because it may not be helping anyone else that you're doing that. Yeah, ex excellent points. Um, always with the uh, the life lessons, Austin is taking care of us here. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree though, both in terms of life and programming, uh, really great points. Um, yeah, so, you know, the, the two things at, that we've talked about so far that to me are the most important would be the bug rule, you know, write less code. And the other would be communicate and have good team processes. Those are definitely the first things I would look for. Um, and yeah, I was just going to talk a little bit at the end here um, about 
some specifics with React um, in terms of, you know, writing, you know, less bugs in your code. Um, I would say when I look at um, anything in terms, like technology-wise, programming-wise, I look for what is this thing good at? What is its strong suits? And I try to, you know, dive into those and, and utilize those. And so React... I would say components. It, it's good at components. Um, and so when I'm looking to make higher quality code, more concise code, easier to read code, I will use components. And that's because React is good at that. And it has a lot of tools for it and a lot of tools for working with it. Um, and in terms of like, you know, writing code with less bugs, I look at composability, and this is something that I'm sure Austin has heard me say many times at this point, but like that is what React is good at. That's what it's for. And I I really like jumping into that and, and utilizing it. And so if you work with me, you'll probably get code reviews where I'm like, can this be made more composable? And what I mean by that is like, instead of thinking of a React component as like its own isolated function, I like to think of it as like Legos, you know, that I'm building with. And this, this is uh, something that not a lot of people are familiar with, but it is super familiar and that's render props. Um, I know, I know we, we looked at that recently, Austin, but you know, it's basically, if you're not familiar with it, it's a prop or it can be children to a React component that are a function. And that allows you to pass state from a component into components that come from somewhere else. Um, and this might sound kind of weird, uh, but I think it's a super powerful way to write high quality code. And the reason for that is because when I am working with code, I think that code, um, how do I say this? Like code that, works together and operates together belongs together. Um, and if you use render props, it makes it super easy to do this. Like let's say you have a dialogue component, right? And you might sometimes have like, you know, uh, button to open or close the dialogue. Uh, you could like have the button live inside of the dialogue component and then like, allow passing in like class names maybe, or you know some way to style it, or props to tell the button where it should be. Should it be in the top right or the top left or whatever? Um, to me, I look at that as like separating concerns too much. You know, the user of the dialogue is the one that wants to determine how that button should look and behave. But the dialogue itself is the thing that should maintain the state and the functions for opening and closing the dialogue. If you use a render prop, you could pass in your own header or your own button, and it can be however you want it to be, and that can use the like open state or the open or close functions of the dialogue without those having to be exposed from the dialogue. Uh, so to me, that's like something I look for in code is, all right, where, where should things belong so that we're not like, creating um, code that lives far apart from each other when it should be living next to each other. Um, yeah, so that's uh, those are some of my thoughts on there. So using React um, for what it's good at and uh, and that is our episode for the React show today. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, and yeah, we'll be back with you soon. Uh, you can reach us in the meantime at owlcreek.studio. Have a good one.